So as many of you know, I absolutely hate the winter. I hate the cold, I hate the short days, I hate the gray days, I hate winter. But about the only thing that I can tolerate with winter is probably the snow, and fortunately around here we don't get much snow. But when it does snow, it's quite the event. And recently it snowed quite a bit here, and that meant it was time for a fun snow day on our sledding hill. And I wanted to capture that in a drawing, and I'm gonna share with you that process in this video. instructor.com and in this video I'd like to share with you the process of creating a piece of art that captures a memory a personal memory a memory of mine a recent personal memory uh, where I take my kids sledding on our local sledding hill it doesn't happen often that we get snow but we did get some snow so uh, of course it meant it was time to go sledding and I want wanted to capture this particular memory so that it looked a little bit like a traditional almost folk artish painting but I also wanted to use colored pencils. So uh, I'm gonna share with you that entire process in just a minute. But I'd like to remind you, if you're new to the channel or if you haven't done so yet, make sure you subscribe and click on the notification bell so you're notified when we upload new videos like this. We cover a broad variety of drawing and painting media and subject matter here on this channel. And if you wanna go deeper with your drawing and painting skills, we do have a membership program over at thevirtualconstructor.com, which includes a variety of drawing and painting courses on a variety of subject matter and media, including a few courses on colored pencil drawing, of course. If you wanna check out our membership program, I'll leave a link in the description below. You can go check it out for free for seven days and see if the program's right for you. If you wanna just dabble a little bit and uh, take a look at three of our course videos and eBooks for free, I'll leave a link in the description below for that as well. Now for this particular drawing, I use Prismacolor Premier Colored Pencils, which are wax-based pencils. But of course you can use any brand that you wish and get similar results. I also use just a bit of Pan Pastel. Now this of course is not required, but I do use the Pan Pastel material to basically create an underpainting or a base in which to apply colored pencils over the top. This drawing is created on Stonehenge paper, which is a wonderful surface for colored pencils. It's 100% cotton, it's very soft. But it does require the artist to apply multiple layered applications with colored pencils, so keep that in mind. If you want to build up lots of depth and color, of course, layering is very important, and this paper encourages it and helps you do it. Of course, when we're dealing with composition, we're talking about the way the elements are laid out within the picture plane. And composition, of course, influences the way a viewer is going to interact with your piece. So it influences the way a viewer's eye is going to move through the piece. Uh, when, I, when I look at this, my eye kind of comes in in this area and then moves its way back to the back of the sledding hill in these distant houses back here. Part of that is because of the layout of the land and the way that we have these little hills that overlap each other. I wanted to accentuate that in the final drawing, or at least capture that in the final drawing, of course. Now, another important aspect about composition, of course, is the focal point. Now, the focal point is um, most of the time the area of importance within a scene, and a lot of times it's where your eye is going to go initially. Now, in this particular case, I'd have to argue that uh, the focal point uh, could be these folks right here, which are my family members. This is my wife, and this is my youngest daughter, and that is my son. I have four kids, so it's a wild place that I live in. I wanted to point out where they're positioned within the picture plane. There is a construct or a device that you can use in your compositions called the rule of thirds, which is based on the golden mean or golden proportion. Now, the way the rule of thirds works is if you consider breaking the composition down into thirds. So I'll just quickly uh, guesstimate here. We'll say that one third is right here and uh, one third is maybe about right here. Um, and then we could do this not just vertically, but also horizontally. So we'll just guesstimate that one third is right here and another is right here. We can see that there are some intersection points that happen here. In these intersection points, there is one obviously right here, one right here, and one right here, and one right here. These are typically good places to put focal points. It 
typically leads to a more aesthetically successful composition. If we take a look at the positioning of my folks down here, we can see that they line up with an intersection point uh, using the rule of thirds. Another thing you'll notice is that on this top dividing line here, that this lines up with the horizon line off in the distance. So that also works out pretty well for our rule of thirds here. So those factors, of course, are helping to make this composition a lot stronger. Now in this photo reference, you'll notice that uh, there are steps or footprints made in the snow over here. In the final drawing, I decide to leave those out so that we have a big rest space uh, over here. And uh, that, uh, of course, allows more focus on our focal point here in the foreground. One more thing regarding drawing or painting snow before we get into the process. And that deals with the color, the hue, or the value of snow. Snow usually has a value associated with it other than white, so it's usually a little bit darker than white, and it also usually has a hue associated with it or a color. To illustrate this, you can see I've placed a white circle over the top of the snow here in the foreground so that you can see the contrast in value and color. We need to keep this in mind when we draw or paint snow. We shouldn't use pure white to depict snow if a realistic appearance is what we're after. All right, now that you have an idea of what was going on in my mind dealing with composition for this particular piece, let's take a look at the steps to create this drawing with pan pastels and colored pencils. We'll begin here on Stonehenge paper using a light graphite pencil. In this case, I'm using a 2H graphite pencil. This is going to be light enough so that it doesn't overpower the image, but I can still put a little bit of pressure on the pencil to make the marks dark enough so that I can see them here. Initially, I'm just finding where the horizon line is and drawing some basic shapes for some of the distant trees before, of course, drawing some shapes for each one of the individual houses. Now I'm using sketchy lines here initially, and of course these lines will not be visible at all in the final drawing. This is just basically a structure for the drawing so that when I begin with the pan pastel and colored pencil applications, I have a general idea of where I need to make marks. Now working on the lower part of the picture plane here in the foreground, I'm establishing uh, the line for the hill of snow that's closest to the viewer, and then also some gestural shapes and lines for the figures in the foreground. Now, during this process, not only am I making marks here and planning out where I'm going to have the different elements within the picture plane, but I'm also kind of getting a feel for the drawing and the composition as well. Now, with the initial sketch in place, we're ready to start with our pan pastel applications. I'm going to use a minimal about amount of pan pastel in this particular image. I'm going to take a bit of white, just a touch of black to mute it slightly, also a bit of ultramarine, and just a touch of yellow ochre to make this gray here. Um, and then we're going to use this gray and apply it using one of the soft applicator tools to the entire sky here. And you can see each time I go back to uh, the pan pastel palette, I am grabbing a little bit of a variety in the color. So in some areas, the blue is a little bit more dominant. In some areas, the black is a little bit more dominant. And during the process, I decide to pick up a little bit of red here as well, just to add a little bit more uh, interest to the sky, of course. Now it's back to the pan pastels and I'm going to pick up a little bit more of the white and here in the foreground I'm going to add a little bit of warmth to the snow so I'm going to allow the yellow ochre to dominate just slightly. Now we'll come back to the pan pastels much later in the process but for now we're going to go ahead and focus on beginning the colored pencil applications. And we'll start with a variety of cooler grays and also some light blues up here. There is a few hints of purple that I've added as well. Uh, I get a little bit creative with this guy in this particular case. Now, throughout this process, I will be referring to the colors uh, occasionally by name and in other instances just by uh, their visual appearance in terms of color theory. And I don't want you to feel like if you're drawing along or if you're trying to recreate maybe the sky or something like that, that you have to use the exact colors that I'm using here. Um, it's always a good idea to, to try to match your own colors. And that gives you experience that you can take with you in, the, in your own drawings and paintings that you create, of course. 
Now for some of these distant trees, we're gonna build up layers of color here. You can see I used a medium yellow green and then over the top I added a warmer gray. And in fact, this color was called Espresso before using a indention tool to basically uh, put indentions in the surface of the paper. This will prevent the colored pencil material from going into those areas. And I just want a few hints of highlight um, or just slightly lighter value um, for these trees that are going to overlap some of these distant grouping of trees here and the indention tool will allow me to do that. So you can see here along the top edge of the distant trees I added a lighter more yellow green and then towards the base of those distant trees of course darker values. Then the espresso pencil was used over the top uh, to make these small branches of this distant tree. Then working my way from the left side of the picture plane to the right, since I am right-handed, um, I began work on some of the houses. And uh, these houses, of course, in this particular drawing are pretty small. Uh, so I found myself sharpening the pencil quite often. And after just a few marks, the pencil becomes fairly dull, uh, which is fine because you'll see that this kind of presents or kind of produces a painterly look, which is really what I'm after in this particular image as well. But uh, you can see here I used a, a, a terracotta color here for the bricks of the house. And then again, that espresso pencil, that dark warm gray for uh, the roof. And I wanted to create a little bit more of a warmer light in the scene. So I used a yellow ochre pencil for the sides or the planes of the houses that faced the light source, which is originating from the left side of the picture plane. And then for the shadowed side of the houses and for the shadows throughout the image, I chose to use a, a blue here, somewhat of a cerulean blue here for the shadowed areas. So this allowed me to layer my applications here um, with the colored pencils initially, just getting the base color in place and then adding that warmer color for the faces of the house that faced the light source and that cooler blue for the shadowed areas which um, as the drawing develops we continue that relationship between those warmer highlights and those cooler shadowed areas with these same two colors. From there, I started working my way down towards the right side of the picture plane, of course, continuing those layered applications, which are so incredibly important with working with uh, colored pencils. And uh, this paper encourages, of course, layered applications, the Stonehenge paper. The tooth or texture of the paper seems relatively weak when you uh, initially touch it, but when you start applying colored pencils, you realize that there's quite a bit of tooth to the surface or quite a bit of tooth associated with the surface, which allows you to apply lots of colored pencil applications and the more applications you add generally the more depth you have in color and more depth in color often leads to a more realistic look so you can see here we had that grouping of trees there uh, before the next house and then of course it was a similar process with each one of these houses here building up basically the local color or the observed color and then on top of it adding that warmth on the highlighted side of the house with the yellow ochre and then that coolness with the blue on the right side of the house. You can see I've added also uh, another couple of groupings of bushes and a, a, a leafless tree there <laughs> before adding uh, a bit of the fence uh, around the yard of this first house here. The espresso pencil here, this is that dark warm gray. If you, if you have a keen eye, you'll notice how much that pencil disappears during this video. Uh, because I used this pencil perhaps more than any other pencil. Another color I used quite a bit was 10% cool gray, which was used in the sky and also the snow. And both of these pencils got used up fairly quickly here. So you can see I continue to work my way down to the right. Again, just working right along the horizon line, developing each one of these houses individually. Again, using similar colors for each one of the houses. This particular house had a little bit more siding on it, uh, a little bit less brick, and uh, that siding was a little bit yellowish. So uh, the yellow ochre proved to be a good choice here for this particular house as well. And for the shadowed areas, of course, we dropped a little bit of blue there to create these cast shadows. Now this blue is Mediterranean blue. And again, I'm using Prismacolor Premier colored pencils here for this particular process. Now I wanted to create a little bit of differentiation between the distant a hill, of course, and the median hill, the hill that's uh, in between the two hills. 
And to do this, I decided to add a little bit more of the Mediterranean blue here and also a bit of purple. And then you'll see in a moment that we burnish these applications with a bit of the 10% cool gray. And here you can see some of that burnishing taking place with the 10% cool gray. Like the Espresso pencil, uh, the 10% cool gray is also a pencil that you can watch slowly dwindle throughout this video because it is used nearly everywhere within the picture plane. And then as you saw, I applied a bit of white over the top to basically burnish and mix those colors together slightly, also slightly making the value a little bit lighter. Then of course it was time to add all of the small figures way off in the distance. And of course these were super tiny considering that I was working on such a small format here for this particular image. You can see I started with the espresso pencil making basic shapes that uh, could resemble people. And and uh, then I went back with a bit of color and just to add a little bit more variety and kind of bring those figures to life. Then as we worked our way down into the bowl here at the bottom portion of the hill, um, I'm adding a bit of that Mediterranean blue and a bit of purple over the top. And the purple that I'm adding here is Parma Violet. And then of course, over the top, a bit of that 10% cool gray, burnishing those applications, and mixing them of course, and bringing that snow to life or making it at least look a little bit more icy. Then of course it was back to the distant houses, again working our way down the horizon line. You can see again very clearly that I've started in the upper left hand corner of the picture plane and I'm working my way progressively down and to the right. Um, and again this is because I'm right handed and I'm trying to preserve the areas that I've already completed since I'm working one section at a time of course. Now if you're left handed you might consider working from the upper right hand portion of the picture plane when you create your drawing and then work your way slowly to the left and lower portion of the picture plane. That might be more comfortable and might help you keep the palm of your hand, of course, out of the way of uh, the material that you already added to the surface. Now, of course, when we work with colored pencils, we've got to keep in mind that it does require a level of patience. And um, sometimes I think one of the easiest areas that you can improve in your drawings, or I should say one of the areas where you can see improvement the quickest is if you just increase your patience a little bit. For some of that's that's going to be a little bit harder to do. But of course, if you just kind of focus on slowing down and um, not trying to be in a hurry to finish your art, uh, I think that you'll see improvement happen naturally. So uh, colored pencils is one of those mediums that can really help to uh, train you to have some patience, of course. <laughs> Now, as we move to the right side of the picture plane, I am going to preserve some of the areas where we have these trees uh, that are in the middle ground. And I'm using the indention tool, of course, as you just saw to do so. And it's not really evident until you start making marks with colored pencils over the top of those areas that you indented. And then you really see those, those marks that you made with the indention tool. So you can see here for these distant trees, I'm adding a, a bit of the same colors that we've used for all the other groupings of trees. So we've got that dark, warm gray, that espresso color, and uh, several middle greens and also a lighter yellow green as well. i am also used a little bit of French gray, you may have seen that, and uh, I did that so that those trees look like they're a little bit further off in the distance. Now if we take a look at the photo reference, you can clearly see that there's not a lot of bright blue showing through in the sky. There is a little bit of that on the right side of the picture plane, but you can see a couple of areas in the sky where I decided to bring in that bright blue that didn't necessarily exist in the photo reference in order to pull again more attention towards the upper edge of the distant sledding hill, of course. Once those distant trees on the right side of the picture plane were somewhat complete, I decided to move my way back to the left side of the picture plane and address some of these trees here that are in the middle ground. And I used the Espresso pencil for this before going back in and filling in some greens there for those distant bushes. Then, of course, just like we did with the first hill, I wanted to create a little bit more of uh, a, di a differentiation between the, the different hills. Of course, we really can't see this. We can see it to a certain degree in the reference, but it's not necessarily as clear. So uh, a little bit of a cool color down on the lower part and complemented by a warmer color at the upper edge of each one of these hills helped to create that contrast that I needed there. So uh, layering some of those blues, mainly the Mediterranean blue and also that Parma violet on the lower portion, and then going over the top of that entire area with a bit of the 10% cool gray before burnishing everything with a white colored pencil really helped to create that differentiation that I was looking for. 
And you can see here, there are several layers applied here. We're still seeing small specks of the paper. And some of that is just due to the nature of the paper, of course, and the size of the drawing. All right, here I decided to add a few folks here uh, in the middle ground. And of course, you when you're doing an image or, or drawing or painting an image where you've got uh, some small figures in the, the background, maybe some medium-sized figures in the foreground, or maybe some larger figures in the foreground, um, you have to be careful of the proportion. So we want to make sure that, proportionally speaking, these shapes that we draw here are make sense with the distant figures and, of course, the figures that we're going to add in the foreground. So in this particular image, we have figures that are really far off in the distance, figures that are, are still pretty far off, but a little bit closer to what we would consider the middle ground, and then figures that are in the extreme foreground as well. And uh, you know, if you get the proportions off in one of these sections, it might throw your whole drawing off. So it's important to kind of check back and forth and uh, just make sure that you're consistent with uh, the size of the figures. And uh, you can see I deviated quite a bit from the photo reference on uh, what figures I included and also the colors that I decided to, to use on each one of these groups of people. Now, of course, directional stroke making is very important, uh, whether you're creating a painting or a graphite drawing, really. And it's also important when we're working with colored pencils. And you can see the directional strokes that I've made, uh, especially in these snowy areas, are I'm trying to flow along with the contours of these sections. So I'm trying to uh, communicate the form of these different sections through the strokes that I make with the colored pencils. And I think it's important to think of this, of course, when you're making your marks in your own colored pencil drawings. Now, of course, I've added some more figures here, again, using the Espresso pencil initially, and then going back with uh, some darker colors, in this case, a bit of indigo blue. The indigo blue mixes nicely with the Espresso to create somewhat of a natural black. It's not super black. It's kind of a, a gray, but it it's a nice darker value to work with. And then after I added some color to each one of these figures, I added shadows, of course. And I'm using the Mediterranean blue for this. And I was taking into account the form of the terrain uh, when I added these shadows. I know the light source is originating from the left side, but you can see uh, with the figures on the hill, I purposely made the shadows kind of flow down the hill where we had the figures in the, the bowl or the lower portion at the bottom of the sledding hill. Uh, the the shadows straightened out quite a bit and of course that helped create that illusion of form there as well. After that it was time to move to the right side of the picture plane and again I used the indention tool to basically just plan out where some of these trees that would overlap the middle ground and background where they would be located and that gave me freedom to make the values darker or lighter. I basically could just preserve these areas until I was ready to address them. And then of course just as we did with the other bushy areas uh, I, I added a bit of the espresso pencil and then that was followed by some indigo blue in areas that middle green a lighter yellow green of course on the highlighted side of the bushes and uh, no black. I should point out that black is not used at all in this drawing. I tend to avoid black when working with colored pencils because black can look very flat. That's not true for all colored pencil manufacturers. Uh, there are some companies that make some blacks that look a little bit more natural for whatever reason. And some surfaces work a little bit better with the color black. But uh, with these Prismacolor Premier pencils, I tend to stay away from black because it's so strong. Instead, I just mix darker values. And uh, dark browns and dark blues work great to create those darker values. And there's a lot of darker values over here on the right side of the picture plane. As you can see, I'm using quite a bit of the Espresso pencil here. But you can also notice here as we're zoomed in very close how well the indention tool works. And of course, if you're not familiar with the indenting tool or indention tool, um, it comes in a variety of different sizes, different tips, just like pencils and different widths, of course. And uh, you can use it to put indentations in the paper to preserve areas, especially helpful when using colored pencils or any other medium where you want to preserve areas and not allow them the medium to kind of go into those recessed areas. So you can see here we're finishing off the top part of the sky here before continuing work on the right side of the picture plane. Now this particular area that we're working it would be considered maybe the middle ground and we can create the illusion of space within a scene by manipulating the value of the objects within the scene. 
And value is the darkness or lightness of a color. So typically objects that are further away are lighter in value and objects that are closer to the viewer have a broader range of value, meaning we might see additional contrast in value in those areas. So because this area is a middle ground, we need to make sure that there's uh, more contrast in this area or at least some darker values in this area so that the areas behind it or further away appear a little bit lighter in value. We can see this with the grouping of trees that's in the middle ground and compare it with the grouping of trees that's in the distant background and how much lighter those groupings of trees are, the ones in the background, compared to the ones that are in the middle ground. Of course, we had a grouping of trees perhaps in the extreme foreground. We don't in this scene, but if we did, of course, the trees in the extreme foreground would, would have an even broader range of value, meaning that there would probably be some darker values in the foreground compared to the middle ground. Now you can see I've added a fence and added a few more trees here and I can use that pencil here. Uh, this is a actually a dark umber pencil um, or I can use really any other pencil that I wish to go into some of those grooves that uh, I've left with the indentation tool. Now I want some specks of the paper to still show through perhaps in some of those areas just so that we have a bit of variety in the color and our trees aren't uh, one color but we see a little bit of a hint of highlight here and there. Uh, it does take some effort to fill in those grooves but you can fill them in if you want to depending on the surface that you're working on. Of course there are some branches and things that uh, are happening underneath the bushes here in the foreground and of course that tree here in the foreground too or really a transition area between the middle ground and foreground. Now my plans for the extreme foreground are to basically leave uh, most of the area devoid of all the footprints that are there in uh, the reference and only leave footprints behind the figures that are there. So that means that the area in the lower left hand portion of the picture plane is going to act somewhat as, as a rest space. And uh, so I decided to go ahead and move on to the figures before addressing the snowy bank. Um, and I started here with a bit of espresso and then layered over the top of it with some indigo blue to create those dark values and of course a pink and a variety of reds there in the shadowed areas and uh, I just repeated this for all of the figures. Of course we don't have to add every single detail that we see or we think we see. We can kind of insinuate things and uh, if you've been watching this video and paying attention of course you've probably noticed that uh, and you can really see this clearly with the houses on the distant uh, on the distant sliding hill that we're just basically using shapes of color and value and we're we're giving the viewer enough information to put the rest of the story together in their own mind so we don't have to describe every single detail that we see it's really just a method or a process of recognizing shapes of color and value and then positioning those shapes of color and value in a similar way as we see them in the reference or with a live subject so you can see here as I've layered in the colors for the figures, um, this is another good example of where you might assume that we have just one color to add in some of these areas, but instead it's several different colors that are layered uh, upon each other to build up depth and complexity there, of course. And uh, the more you do this, of course, the more realism you're going to achieve in your colored pencil drawings. And also the quicker you're going to get to that point where you've got enough of that waxy material on the surface where it really becomes a, a process that's akin to painting instead of drawing. So here we're adding a bit of pink over the top of the purple again just to add a bit more variety to the color and if you're wondering what colors you can add you might see a section um, that, and you think well I have the perfect color for it and you just might pick out that color. Why would you add more colors to it? To, well the, the answer to that is um, if you add a little bit more variety to the specific color it just makes that color or that section within the drawing or painting a little bit more interesting as well. So with the the sled here that the woman's holding the, the purple sled. It added a bit of purple and then a little bit of pink over the top, a little bit of purple over the top of that as well. And that just adds a little bit more to the color instead of just adding a purple, for example. Now you can see here I've gone back with the pan pastel and here in the foreground I'm adding a bit of snow <laughs> uh, covering the entire area and you'll notice that the snow is warm so a bit of yellow ochre is mixed in with the white and of course a touch of black there just to, to mute it back a little bit. And uh, we see that warmth through the snow throughout this, uh, this drawing. 
uh, because of the base layers that we added with the pan pastel. So we're going to continue that in the foreground. And we're going to allow the lower part of the foreground to be a little bit cooler and the upper portion of the foreground to be a little bit warmer. Uh, so you can see here I'm adding a bit of a lighter blue here to the snowy area as well to make it feel a little bit cooler before going back over the top of it with a 10% cool gray and then, of course, a bit of white as well. And uh, here is another area where you can really see where the directional stroke making plays a role in communicating the form. I tried to make these strokes flow along the form or the contour of this hillside in the foreground. Now for the part that I waited the longest for, and that was, of course, to add these footprints. Um, and, of course, I wanted this image to tell a story, and I wanted only these three figures here in the foreground to, uh, to be the first people to have uh, gone over this snowy bank here. So that's why I decided to leave out the other footprints and just focus on the footprints leading to the three individuals making their way to the sledding hill. And then, of course, after burnishing some of those applications with a bit of the 10% cool gray, I went back to the figures and made some final adjustments here, making the contrast a little bit stronger and adding a few bits of shadow here and there to the backside of some of the clothing. Then I decided to make the lower portion of the left side of the picture plane a little bit cooler, and I did that again with a bit of a lighter blue there just to create a little bit more variety. Then, of course, when the drawing is complete, it's time to tear away the tape. And this can be a nerve-wracking experience. You've spent all this time on the drawing, and you don't want the tape to tear. But if you pull it away at a 90-degree angle, usually you can pull that tape off without any tearing. And with the tape removed, our drawing is complete here. And I think my goal was achieved here of telling a story with somewhat of a traditional painting with colored pencils. Thanks so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Hope you were able to pick up a couple of things here and there. Remember, if you're new to the channel, subscribe and click on the notification bell. If you want to check out our membership program, there's a link in the description below. And if you want to check out three free course videos and eBooks, there's a link in the description below for that as well. Thanks again for watching. And as always, I wish you all the very best in your artistic success.